In today's Writing Wednesday, I'd like to talk about one of the things that's both a great joy and also a great source of fear and trepidation in writing historical fiction, and that's dealing with real people. I mean, not the real people around me all the time, that's a whole other set of issues, but the real historical characters that I sometimes encounter in the process of setting a fictional story in the past. Now, of course, there are historical fiction writers who have made whole careers out of writing novels about real people and fictionalizing their stories. I've done a bit of that myself with writing uh, The Violent Friendship of Esther Johnson, which was about a real woman, and, of course, the series of uh, novels that I've written about biblical characters. But what I'm talking about today is a little different from that. It's what happens when you create fictional characters at a real time and place in the past, and then they end up bumping into or bumping up against real people who lived in that time and place. Now, in my previous two Newfoundland historical novels, uh, By the Rivers of Brooklyn and That Forgetful Shore, I didn't have that situation to deal with, but it's coming up a lot in A Sudden Sun Discloses because my two characters, uh, my fictional characters, Lily Hunt and her daughter Grace Brown, are both in their own way very politically active and active in some important movements of the time, so they end up meeting some real people. But of all the real historical characters I've discovered so far, there's none that's captivated me as much as a real woman about whom we don't know a whole lot. Uh, but her name was Jessie Murray Oman, and I'm finding her really fascinating to take this sketch of a historical woman and turn her into a full-fledged fictional character. Jessie was the wife of a St. John's businessman. She was the secretary of the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she published, edited, and mostly, largely wrote herself uh, a monthly magazine called The Water Lily, which I've referred to before, which railed against the evils of the liquor trade and promoted votes and greater sphere of public life for women. In 1893, as the Newfoundland House of Assembly was preparing to decide whether women should be given the right to vote in local option elections, uh, the Evening Telegram attacked the inane and hysterical criticisms of those women's rights agitators who fulminate against the government through the columns of the strong-minded water lily. From the terrors of such strong-minded lady agitators, good Lord deliver us! Now I kind of get the impression from reading Jessie Ullman's strong-minded writing in the water lily that she was more than capable of taking on such attackers. And by the way, isn't it interesting that there was a time when strong-minded was an insult you could use to put a woman down? Presumably the ideal woman was a little more weak-minded. Certainly Jessie Oman had no problem in attacking the men who stood in the way of what she saw as progress. This included her own brother, James Murray, who was a member of the House of Assembly. And when he spoke out in the legislature against women's suffrage, she responded with a column in the Water Lily in which she said, The best part of Mr. Murray's speeches is when he sits down. By the time the bill for women's suffrage came up a second time, James Murray had changed his vote. Possibly because of his strong-minded sister? We don't know. But Jessie Ullman reserved her harshest words for the premier of the day, William Whiteaway. Now, Whiteaway, when the women's suffrage bill came up, claimed that he was not opposed to the underlying issue, which was an, a law banning the sale of liquor. But he had grave reservations because he was afraid that a women's vote on that issue would just be the thin edge of the wedge that would lead to general suffrage for women. I did not expect to hear such observations when we have it laid down in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that women shall be subject to man. That is the law of Scripture. It is the woman's province to exercise her influence in the home circle, in the education and training of her sons and daughters, and to meet her husband with a kindly greeting when he returns from his daily occupations. If the franchise were conferred, she would be absent from the home circle and those important duties would be neglected. I want to see the home adorned by the presence of the wife. In the home, the sweetness of her power and influence are most beneficially exercised, and many a man today has been saved from a drunkard's grave by the kindness and attention of a good wife. In the same speech, Sir William also took a direct attack at the water lily, saying that because of its pernicious influence, the paper should better be called the Deadly Nightshade. Not to be outdone, in the very next issue of the water lily, Mrs. Ullman published in her editorial page a stinging rebuke of Sir William Whiteaway, saying that if he wanted the paper called the Deadly Nightshade, it must be because he wanted it named after himself for he was, indeed, the deadly knight. Of all the speeches we have ever heard, that of Sir William W. V. Whiteaway, delivered at the debate on the women's suffrage bill, decidedly takes the palm for vulgarity. Had he been speaking to a drunken mob, he could not have used more appropriate language. We availed ourselves of the legitimate mode of approaching the legislature, namely by petitions, requesting the right to say whether a liquor store should or should not be open in our neighborhood. 
Sir William Whiteaway, Premier of Newfoundland and leader of the strongest political party that any leader ever had, from his lofty position, not only refused to listen to our prayer, but took advantage of the opportunity to heap ridicule upon the petitioners in a most ungentlemanly manner. Of course, there is no other way open to the women of Newfoundland than to use all their strength, intelligence, and influence in the endeavor to defeat this Goliath. I love this back and forth repartee, and I love this glimpse into, you know, politics and real people over a hundred years ago as they debated these issues. And it's really fun to be able to work that into my novel and to be able to give a voice to long dead historical characters like Jessie Murray Oman, who certainly didn't mind using her own voice when she was alive.